Well, I'm going to be speaking with you today about a heat wave that we heard a little bit about earlier, the 2012 heat wave in the Northwest Atlantic, and really trying to use that event to examine some of the impacts and responses within Maine's lobster fishery. So uh, just to orient you, uh, during 2012, we experienced a large scale marine heat wave across the Northwest Atlantic. Um, this this uh, southern extent extended down to Cape Hatteras in North Carolina, and then all the way over across the North Atlantic to Iceland and north into the Labrador Sea. This was the largest, most intense warm event that we had experienced in this area in 30 years since the um, satellite sea surface temperature data were available. And I think that reporting on this event was actually the first time the term marine heat wave was used in the scientific literature. And the Gulf of Maine was really at the epicenter of this event. You can see the Gulf of Maine right here. Temperatures during the summer of 2012 were running about two and a half to three degrees Celsius above the long-term average and persisted over most of the year in 2012. Um, so those warm temperatures had important ramifications that played out through Maine's lobster fishery that year. And I'm just gonna use this as a case study to dive into some of the uh, issues that arose and some of the insights we've gained from that experience. So the American lobster fishery is the most valuable single species fishery in the US and has been since 2014. Back in 2009, it was valued at about $650 million. Um, and then in the state of Maine, it is particularly important because it accounts for more than 80% of the landed value of all marine fisheries in the state. So not only is it economically important, in many of the coastal communities in Maine, the way of life that exists there is really tied to fishing and particularly to the lobster fishery. So the social importance as well as the traditions and cultural importance of this fishery is particularly important. Um, as you get to mid coast Maine and further down east, particularly in many of the rural communities where fishing is still a dominant um, dominant part of the economy and experience. In 2012, when we had the marine heat wave in the region, I'm going to start with walking you through what temperatures look like and then trace that into the biology and the fishery. So I'm showing you here a plot of the annual cycle of temperatures. In the blue area, we see the long-term average temperature cycle over the course of most years from 1982 when we started collecting satellite sea surface temperature data through 2011. So using that period um, as the prior experience before the 2012 heat wave occurred. And then in 2012, we have the temperatures showing up in the gray line. So during 2012, if you think about this in time, the warming that occurs in the spring was running about three weeks ahead of schedule. So temperatures were warm coming into the year, but this uptick in temperatures occurred very early. And the rise in spring temperatures is really important for lobster. It affects them in three different ways. First, lobsters tend to be further offshore during the winter and they move into the shallow coastal waters. And a large portion of the lobster fishery is a small scale fishery that's prosecuted by small vessels operating just in those coastal waters. Um, warming also increases the rate of movement in general, the activity rate of lobsters. So they're more likely to move into and out of traps and to be caught in those traps. And one really important effect of temperature is that it cues molting in lobsters. And molting is the process by which lobsters grow. They shed their, they shed their shells and then can grow into their next shell. And um, we have a size limit on harvesting lobsters in the state of Maine. About 85% of the landed lobsters have just molted into that legal size class where they can be harvested. So this molting process is really important in the fishery. In 2012, we saw all these things kind of align together and it resulted in a very early start to the high landings period in the fishery. So we see here, in, again in blue, what the landing cycle looked like over the course of most years from 82 to 2011, and then what it looked like in 2012 in gray. You can see that there's this much earlier start to this high ramp up in landings volume um, during 2012. In fact, if we compare June and July of 2012 to 2011, we see that in Maine alone, 
uh, just in those two months, more than 15 million pounds more lobster was landed in 2012 than during the preceding year. So lobster uh, fishermen on the water were able to harvest the species that they routinely fish for. But in 2012, we realized that the supply chain wasn't able to keep up. So harvesters on the water are able to bring the product to the docks, but most of our processing capacity for lobster was in Canada. So dealers didn't have trucking contracts in place to move the product to Canada. And in fact, there wasn't sufficient processing capacity there anyway to absorb the product volume that was available. Um, typically, the Canadian season ends before the ramp up of high landings occurs in the US fishery. And in 2012, we started, there was already a high volume in the Canadian, Canadian fishery that year and a high volume coming in from the US fishery that overlapped and there just wasn't the capacity to clear the product. So it resulted in a glut of product on the market, led to tension with the, between the US and Canadian industries and ultimately led to a price collapse. The price dropped to the lowest level ever recorded in the fishery during 2012. And you can see here that it is quite a substantial difference from even the past low, uh, low price experiences. So this obviously was a, a huge shock to the lobster fishery in Maine. And what I wanna focus on now is a little bit about how the fishery responded. So some of the um, responses that we saw to the 2012 heat wave occurred in the harvest sector with harvesters realizing that the high temperatures that they were experiencing were really detrimental to the quality of lobsters that they were able to get back to the docks. So mortality rates were higher than usual and the stress on the lobsters was higher than usual. So during um, or since 2012, uh, many lobstermen have now implemented measures on their boats that during high temperature conditions, they take uh, different precautions to preserve the quality of the products. Uh, it might include cooling, chilling the water, aerating water tanks, um, those types of measures that can help enhance the value of the product and the, the, um, the viability of the product essentially when it gets back to the docks. Um, there's also been adjustments throughout the whole supply chain uh, with dealers now having more flexible transportation contracts in place. Um, processing capacity has increased and particularly has grown within the US in the state of Maine. And there were also a number of marketing efforts led by the Maine, um, the Maine Lobster Collaborative to expand the market um, to absorb product or lobster product in the future. So some of this expansion supported long-term growth, like the growth of markets in Asia and Europe, but also uh, thinking about ways to clear product quickly if needed. So lower level um, buyers also became really important, um, including places like Panera and even McDonald's in some years selling lobster. And we also saw um, sort of interest increase in scientific information that could support planning for changes and variability and uncertainty. We were asked um, if we could have predicted the fact that the 2012 season would play out as it did. And in fact, when we started looking at this, we found that there was a really strong relationship between spring temperatures and when we expected the high landings period of the fishery to start. So for several years, we produced a forecast that would indicate whether we expected to, the season to begin early or late um, relative to kind of the normal uptick in the high volume landings period. And in 2012, when we sort of ran this as a, a hindcast using just the observations made through 2011, the prediction we would have made for 2012 would have been within three days of when the uptick actually occurred that we could sort of check once the data were available for that fishing season. These, um, as I mentioned, the responses have been quite variable and I think have indicated that we have um, taken important adaptive measures and built in some resilience to this fishery. During 2016, we experienced a subsequent heat wave. The cycle of landings looked very similar to 2012. So 2012 is shown in the red line and 2016 in black. You can see this early start to the season 
really occurred in a very similar way and the high volume that was experienced in both years um, tracks each other really closely. But during 2012, if you look at the price, we had this price collapse. If you look at the solid red line, and in 2016, the price held within the range of variability that's been experienced over time and at a much higher price point than was experienced during 2012. So the supply chain adjustments that were made have helped buffer the impact in subsequent heat wave experiences. And I think that learning these lessons and thinking about other adaptive measures and ways of enhancing resilience in the fishery and in fisheries beyond lobster, drawing these lessons out uh, and generalizing from them is incredibly important. So this figure is showing in colors, the temperature anomalies as we've experienced them in the Gulf of Maine, essentially over individual days across the course of a year, there's a color for each anomaly and then the years move up the figure. And so while the colors indicate the anomalies, what I really want you to pay attention to are the black lines. The black lines indicate that we're above the threshold that we would consider a heat wave. And so you can see 2012 here, where there's a black line extending over most of the year. We've also had subsequent um, years in which we've had heat waves during large portions of the year in 2016, 2018, 2020, and now again in 2021. And I haven't um, updated this. This is not quite updated, but about a month ago when we looked at that, um, we found that only about 20 days in 2021 in the Gulf of Maine would not have exceeded that threshold of being considered a marine heat wave. And so this just gives you a sense of what this year looks like in the Gulf of Maine. You can see that for much of the, um, of the year, we've had heat waves ex exceeding that two and a half degree Celsius sort of um, range. And I said in 2012, we were during the summer between two and a half and three degrees Celsius. And in 2021, we've had some exceptionally warm days where we've even been above three and a half degree Celsius anomaly. And what is also really striking to me in this figure is that we don't really have any days uh, in 2021 where we're sort of below, we're, we're not tracking normal ever. So we're always above a half a degree Celsius warmer than the long-term average in this, um, in this area. So I think some of the takeaways that I hope that you will um, sort of derive from this one case study is that um, thinking about resilience to marine heat waves in fisheries will be really important in the future. We are expecting more frequent marine heat waves um, as temperatures generally warm. And this comes back to the baseline discussion we've had a few times. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about that further. But what this means is essentially the past expectations that we've derived for what we think marine ecosystems might look like, how we think fish populations might behave and fisheries perhaps may um, sort of play out against those populations, those past expectations are no longer reliable analogs for what we should think about and expect in the future. So thinking about measures that support resilience in our social ecological systems built around fisheries will be really important. And these relate to um, starting with the ecology and biology of species that support fisheries. In, lobster, in the lobster fishery, conservation measures that were put in place decades ago to protect large lobsters and female lobsters have been really important for enhancing the health of the Gulf of Maine lobster population as waters have warmed in the region. So these conservation measures to protect stock health will be uh, important across a number of fisheries as we look ahead. Flexibility and adaptive capacity is important throughout the social ecological system. And I um, demonstrated in the lobster case, I just shared with you how that adaptive capacity in the harvest sector, as well as throughout the supply chain was particularly um, important in affecting the impacts during 2012 and also affecting the adaptive responses that occurred since that time. And I think also looking for uh, thinking about forward-looking information and having a forward-looking perspective on decisions will become increasingly important. Um, there's already efforts that take a variety of different forms to develop 
scientific information to support these more forward looking decisions. And I think also important to couple with that is a mindset of expecting to function in systems that are changing and the uncertainty that's associated with those changes. And just generally baking resilience into that mindset is, in, is really important. So I'd be happy to discuss these topics further. Uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, there are a number of important collaborators on just the work I shared with you today, and obviously a much larger group of collaborators that has shaped our research around warming and heat waves in the Gulf of Maine more broadly, um, also to acknowledge NSF and NASA for funding. So I'd be happy to take questions now, and I also wanted to share my email for later um, or next week to have a chance to chat with you further. Thank you.